<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We are back. Come on, Rockfin. All right, here we go. All right, so... I know a lot of people were anxious for me to continue on the Jack Valenti files, and I'm going to, just not today. I just finished the chapter on Carrie Thornley, and so I am excited about a couple documents to talk about, and then we're going to go over some uh, of the additional Thornley material from the Garrison files once we get through these initial couple documents. So the theme of the Carrie Thornley chapter really was to show that he was impersonating Oswald and that he played a much higher role in the setup of Oswald, particularly in New Orleans, uh, with the printing of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee flyers, um, as well as uh, a number of appearances that were made with Marina Oswald. But that's all going to be in the book. And uh, speaking of which, the book should be finished uh, this week. Uh, I plan on uh, working on the Jack Valenti chapter today and the rest of the week. Uh, hopefully I can get it done by the weekend. Uh, and then spend a couple days next week doing the editing and whatnot. And I'm planning on a currently a September 1st uh, official release, even though it'll probably be finished before then. So if you haven't pre-ordered the book yet, I highly advise you do so. Uh, for 25 bucks, you get uh, a copy of the ebook. You get four chapters currently. You get my notes, and you get access to my private chat. Once the book actually releases... Um, it's going to be a little bit more expensive to get my notes and all the other stuff. So I highly recommend that everybody pre-order the book as soon as possible. Buymeacoffee.com slash JFKbook. And on that note, I shall begin. <clears throat> this is a memorandum to Jonathan Blackmer, reference Kerry Thornley from Jim Garrison. The purpose of this memo was to summarize and to note down some additional random leads based upon evidence obtained by me in the late 60s and still obtainable, not presently represented by statements directly at hand or immediately locatable in any files available to us. However, all of the information here under is confirmable and most of the specific supporting material is likely to be obtained shortly. One, Barbara Reed. Uh, Barbara Reed was an associate of Thornley. Barbara Reed's recollection of Thornley and Oswald in New Orleans together following the former's return from Mexico City. Barbara Glancy Reed, 921 Chartres Street, encountered Carrie Thornley and Lee Oswald together at the Bourbon House one evening. It should be kept in mind that Carrie Thornley's Warren Commission testimony is to the effect that he never saw Lee Oswald while in New Orleans. From Carrie Thornley's conversation, it was apparent to her that he had just returned from Mexico City. Previously, unlike Lee Oswald, who had thin hair and wore it short, Kerry Thornley had always worn his hair long. Now it was noticeably thinned down to the point where Reed told them that they looked like the Gold Dust Twins. Kind of a funny reference because the Gold Dust Twins were uh, two white guys in blackface who did a radio show. <laughs> uh, this is only one example <clears throat> of Mrs. Reed's value as a witness worth interviewing. She is knowledgeable not only about an aspect of the Carrie Thornley-Lee Oswald relationship as indicated above, but about several other characters of interest. Reed is highly intelligent, acute in observation and recollection, especially as to the French Quarter characters and activities in the 1960s. Her veracity, in my judgment, is beyond question. In view of subsequent Carrie Thornley developments and potential, a new detailed interview of Mrs. Reed may be in order. Statements of mag uh, two statements of Magazine Street neighbors of the relationship of Carrie Thornley and Marina Oswald. Uh, this I have some more detailed information on besides what I'm about to read to you, but that's gonna have to wait because that's in my book. Um, and uh, I named the neighbor who witnessed uh, Thornley and Marina and Oswald and, and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald together. Uh, statements of Magazine Street neighbors of the relationship of Carrie Thornley and Marina Oswald. This point is relative to Kerry Thornley's denial before the Warren Commission that he knew that Lee Oswald was in New Orleans at the same time he was. <clears throat> Neighbors of the Oswalds responded positively to Thornley's picture. Some of them, in fact, stated that they had seen Kerry Thornley going to the grocery store, a Win dixie as I recall, so often together that the, uh, they thought he was her husband. And following the news publicly, 
uh, or news publicity of the assassination were confused by Oswald's picture in the papers. An effort will be made to locate copies of these neighbors' statements, but if this is not successful, a new initiated approach to that area of Magazine Street still might be productive in view of the positiveness of the response of the neighbors on this point to carry Thornley's picture. So this was very important to me because we have uh, at least uh, four or five or even maybe six or seven sightings of Oswald where he's driving an old beat-up car. And with him is uh, a pregnant woman and uh, a daughter, a, a young child, a female child. Uh, later, after October, that kind of transitions to um, Oswald driving a car seen with his wife and two children, right? But I, <clears throat> I attest uh, that... None of those sightings were Oswald. Oswald never drove a car. Marina was in on the setup. Kerry Thornley was in charge of the setup. And so, yes, it was most certainly Kerry Thornley and Marina Oswald. And the identification of the witness that puts Kerry Thornley and Marina Oswald together at the Oswald house uh, was key to my research. All right. <clears throat> Next one. This is an FBI uh, report dated 12-9-63. Gus Beeler, assistant manager, Bourbon House Restaurant and Bar, 700 Bourbon Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, stated he does not know Lee Harvey Oswald or Jack Ruby, and to his knowledge, has never met either individual. Hang on just one second. Next one. All right, so Gus Beeler advised... After viewing photographs of both Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby, that he could not identify either person as being a patron of the Bourbon House. Uh, Gus Beeler stated that there has been considerable conversation in the Bourbon House regarding Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald, particularly by the wife of Carrie Thornley. Both Thornley and his wife, according to Beeler, were regular patrons of the restaurant and bar, and well known to most of the customers. Thornley and his wife separated about the time of the assassination of President Kennedy. And since that time, Mrs. Thornley has been running down her husband and telling everyone who will listen to her that he, Thornley, was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald. In addition, Beeler advised that Carrie Wendell Thornley has made public statements which have appeared in the local newspapers that he has either written a book or is writing a book in which he uses Lee Harvey Oswald as a model for a character in the book. Beeler stated that he did not know if this was true, but it has been the subject of conversation in the Bourbon House. Beeler advised that other than remarks about Carol, Carrie Wendell Thornley, which have been passed in the Bourbon House, he can think of no other individual frequenting the Bourbon House um, who might have known Lee Harvey Oswald. So that was pretty interesting. Um, this basically shows that um, Jeannie Hack, who was uh, Thornley's girlfriend, but they uh, would call each other husband and wife. This was um, kind of evidence that Thornley and Oswald knew each other. And that's important because I attest that Thornley uh, was primarily Oswald's handler. Even though they were in the Marines together, it seems as though uh, when you look at the set of circumstances, it seems as though Thornley was in charge and he was telling Oswald what to do. That, I believe, is uh, evident with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee flyers. All right, what's next? All right, so another FBI report dated December 7th, 1963. Waddell Robertson, also known as Slim Robertson, different Slim from the Slim Brooks we were talking about. Waddell Robertson, also known as Slim Robertson, was interviewed at 104 Woodland Drive, Irving, Texas, where he is employed by Mr. Ellis Dunn as a yard man. Robertson stated that in the latter part of August or first part of September 1963, he and his wife, Opal Robertson, saw a white man about 25 years of age, 5 foot 9, 5 foot 10 inches tall, weighing about 160 pounds, with dark hair, receding at the temples, clean shaven, and had no glasses. As this man was firing a rifle at the Trinity River bottom behind 104 Woodland Drive, Irving, Texas. Robertson said a man had piled two bales of hay on top of one another and was using the hay bales for a resting place for the rifle. Robertson explained this occurred shortly after a mower had cut the grass in the river bottom and the bales of hay were lying about easily available. The man had an unidentified woman and small boy with him. The boy appeared to be about four years of age. He described the woman as in her 20s, 5'6", 130 pounds, dark hair, no glasses. Robertson was unable to note the caliber or detailed description of the rifle being fired by this man and stated that he did note the rifle had a scope on it. 
Robertson said after the assassination of President Kennedy, when he saw pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald on television and in the newspapers, he felt the man that he had seen in the Trinity River Bottom looked like Oswald. Robertson said the man was shooting at a homemade bullseye target, which he had placed on the side of the levee in the Trinity River Bottom. The woman and small boy stood and watched him while he fired the rifle. The day the man was observed firing the rifle, Robertson observed a parked car nearby, which presumably belonged to the man doing the shooting. Although Robertson did not see the man leave in the car, Robertson described this as a black car, make not known, model early 1950s. Robertson advised about four or five days later, he first saw the man in the latter part of August 1963. He and his wife Opal were fishing in the Trinity River when the same man came up alone and spoke to them. The man asked Robertson and his wife if they were catching anything and stood and talked to them for five or ten minutes. Robertson said the man's manner was pleasant and he asked where Robertson and his wife lived. When they told the man they lived nearby, uh, the man told Robertson and his wife he lived in Irving, but he did not specify an address. So this is a pretty interesting incident. Um, so let's look at the descriptions of the people who uh, Robertson observed. He observed a man who looks like Lee Harvey Oswald, right? To me, it's obviously Kerry Thornley. He's driving a black car, so Thornley obviously had a selection of vehicles to choose from wherever he was staying. Um, he's identified as 5'9 to 5'10. That's uh, 160 pounds. It's completely consistent with all the other observations of uh, Oswald that we have seen and Kerry Thornley and William Seymour. Uh, and he describes the man as having been there with a woman in her 20s, 5'6", 130 pounds. Um, okay, um, there's a couple problems with his descriptions here. Um, now, if this woman is Marina, Marina's only 5' tall, not 5'6", but he is observing them from a distance, uh, and he has made another mistake here. He has said that they were with a small boy. I don't buy that for a second. I think he was just far enough away that he couldn't tell. I think it was uh, Carrie Thornley, Marina, and they were with a child, uh, obviously June Oswald. Um, and he just couldn't make that differentiation from far away. I mean, it, does, it, it sounds shitty and there's not much substantiation here, but there's no other possibility. There's no small boy anywhere else in the entire goddamn story. I don't see any other possibility of any other people it could have been other than Carrie Thornley and Marina. Uh, this um, There's a whole bunch of incidents that occurred outside of Alice, Texas. I didn't pull up those documents. That's all going to be in the book. And from here, we will move into Garrison's file on additional Thornley material. And it's dated October 77. So this is material that came in after the initial, after the Clay Shaw trial. He continued the investigation for, oh God, it must have been the rest of his life. But um, this is some of the additional Thornley material. And as we go through it, you'll see that some of the stuff doesn't seem to apply. Right, some of this stuff doesn't really apply to Thornley. It doesn't seem, although it may, and I might just be wrong, doubtful. Uh, but uh, we're going to go over a lot of this stuff, and it doesn't. A lot of it doesn't seem to have anything to do with uh, Thornley or anything else. Uh, why it got stuck in this um, folder, I'm not really sure. Um. All right. Let's see. All right. Let's. This first page has something to do with Sylvia Duran. Sylvia Duran was the uh, woman in Mexico City who dealt with Oswald at the. Um, at the embassy down in Mexico City. So, actually, I'm going to skip this. This, it's, it's, this picks up halfway through a document. Uh, next, it continues on to Commission Exhibit number 3048, and it's a news uh, report from Dallas. Mauser found in fifth floor staircase. A rifle found in the staircase of the fifth floor of the building on which the assassin is believed to have shot the president of the United States. Uh, sheriffs identify the weapon as a 7.65 Mauser, a German-made army rifle with a telescopic sight. It had one shell in the chamber. Three spent shells were found nearby. So there's a lot of obfuscation over what happened with the rifle inside the depository. All that's going to be in the book also. Um, ultimately, this rifle here was fired by Lawrence Howard, and he stashed it in the fifth floor. Well, actually, it's like if you open the stairwell from the sixth floor, you have stairs that lead to the fifth floor, obviously, and that's where the rifle was. So it looked like he dipped inside that the, uh, the stairwell, dropped the rifle, went back, and then headed down the elevator where he escaped out the back door. <clears throat> um, these photographs. Uh, Monday then tell... Oh, no, this... See, this is a fucking mess. Uh, so, obviously, let me see. This jumps around from Commission Exhibit 3048 to 3046. And then 3047. But I'm going to skip all that shit because Garrison seemed to have just thrown it in there and it doesn't really seem to have much to do with 
uh, Carrie Thornley. All right, so we're moving on to this uh, September 17th, 1964 CIA memorandum uh, to Mr. J. Lee Rankin. Subject. Yusabayo Ezku, former Cuban council, Mexico City. In your verbal request, I forward information about Esbu... Whatever, I'm not going to say that fucking bullshit name. And views on his dealing with Lee Harvey Oswald. We surmise that the reference is Oswald's 9th of November letter to a man who had since been replaced must refer to Cuban consul Azcu and left Mexico for Cuba on a permanent transfer on 18th November 1963. Four days before the assassination, Azcu had been in Mexico... For 18 years, and it was known as early as September 1963 that Askew was to be replaced. His replacement did arrive in September. Askew was scheduled to leave in October, but did not leave until November 18th. We do not know who might have told Oswald that Askew or any other Cuban had been or was to be replaced, but we speculate that Sylvia Duran or some Soviet official might have mentioned it if Oswald complained about Askew's altercation with him. Interesting. New memorandum, CIA. To J. Lee Rankin. Subject, technical examination of photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald's application for Cuban visa. I refer you to your request of 1 September 1964 that the Central Intelligence Agency undertake a technical analysis of photographed copies of Lee Harvey Oswald's application for a Cuban visa prepared by him in the Cuban consulate in Mexico City and reply from Havana conditionally rejecting Oswald's application. Qualified and analysts of this agency have examined and tested these documents and have made the following determination. The signature Lee H. Oswald affixed to the visa application is the signature of Lee Harvey Oswald. Bullshit. They're lying. Uh, because that would imply that Oswald actually went to the consulate in New Orleans in September, I believe the 17th, to get that... Uh, uh, to, to sign that um, visa application, but he didn't. He didn't because it was Carrie Thornley who went there, not fucking Oswald. So the CIA is lying and covering for him, or um, every single goddamn signature that we know of, or handwriting sample that we know of of Oswald is actually Carrie Thornley, which I don't doubt. It's a possibility. <clears throat> Uh, B, the notation in the lower left corner of the visa application form, which reads Hotel de Comercio, room 1846-6051, was probably written by Mrs. Sylvia Duran, an employee of the Cuban consulate. We're unable to make a definitive statement about this handwriting because the notation is too faint and the sample of Miss Duran's handwriting available for comparison is inadequate for the purpose. It is possible to state with confidence that the notation was not written by Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay, so they're covering for Oswald saying it's his signature. Well, they're not covering for him. They're throwing him under the bus by saying it's his signature. But obviously, um, Garrison threw this into the Kerry Thornley file for a reason because he knew it was Kerry Thornley who went to Mexico City, not Oswald. Okay, here's another interesting one. This is involving Jerry Buchanan in Miami. So this is a FBI report dated March 30th, 64, titled Lee Harvey Oswald, Internal Security, Russia, Cuba. Synopsis, Jerry Buchanan interviewed 326-64, Fairhope, Alabama, where he was temporarily residing, stated that he was one of a group which fought the members of Fair Play for Cuba Committee who were distributing pro-Castro literature. Bayfront Park, Miami, October 1962, stated that after assassination of President Kennedy and attending uh, publicity given to subject Oswald, he recognized Oswald as having been one of the members of the Fair Play for Cuba committee with which the group had had a fight. Uh, also recalled that Oswald had been in Miami in March of 63, distributing pro-Castro literature. <clears throat> stated his brother Jim Buchanan as specific information concerning Oswald being in Miami during these periods. Details. Interview at Jerry Buchanan. Interview of Jerry Buchanan is predicated on information received from Nathaniel Whale, W-E-Y-L, an author residing at Delray Beach, Florida. Mr. Whale, on March 13, 1964, advised that Jim Buchanan, who was a reporter for the Pompano Beach, Florida Sun Sentinel, told Whale that Jerry, his brother, had a fight with Lee Harvey Oswald at Miami, Florida at the beginning of 1963. At Fairhope, Alabama, the Southwestern Bell Telephone Directory reflects that number 928-2925 is listed to Craig T. Sheldon, 457 Oak Street, Fairhope, Alabama. 
Craig T. Shelton, 457 Oak Street on March 26, 64, advised that Jerry Buchanan is presently living with him and employed as a pipeline company in a pipeline company in Fairhope, Alabama, and stated that he and Jerry Buchanan through his brother, Jim Buchanan, or he'd met him through his brother, Jim Buchanan, and had agreed to let Jerry reside with him and his family in Fairhope, Alabama. Sheldon advised that he is Southeastern Chairman of the International Anti-Communist Brigade, headquartered in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and both Jim and Jerry Buchanan are officers therein. So, <clears throat> I don't believe for a split second that Oswald was ever in Miami doing anything with Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Also, this is in... When did he say? March of 1963. However, we don't have any indication that Oswald had anything to do with the Fair Play for Cuba committee until May of 1963. Although you have a number of incidents like this that pop up where it's claimed that Oswald had interaction with them prior. There's even some letters that were exchanged back and forth that show uh, that Oswald, a.k.a. Kerry Thornley, uh, was actually in contact with them long before, going back, I think, to October of 62. So... Yeah, but here's the problem. I don't believe that this was Carrie Thornley either. When you look at the dates, who was living in Miami that was impersonating Oswald? William Seymour. William Seymour was in Miami at this time. So I don't see why they would send fucking Carrie Thornley down to Miami to impersonate Oswald when you got William Seymour who could do it just as easily. All right, what is this? Um... Something on Jack Ruby. We haven't talked about Jack Ruby yet. There's a couple people we're not going to talk about for a while. Jack Ruby, Samuel Ruby, uh, Clay Shaw. These are guys that um, are going to end up being in an update to my book like a year from now. And so we're going to end up putting that stuff off until I can really get through it myself first. And then I'll present it here. So you can plan on it being like at least six months before we get to Jack Ruby or Clay Shaw. But I'll read this little uh, tidbit here. Dated 7 64 Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Israel Horowitz was telephonically contacted in an effort to make an appointment for an interview. He was contacted at a telephone number BR4-7250. Mr. Horowitz acknowledged that about three weeks before he moved his business from 1108 West Lawrence, Chicago, Illinois to 6344 North Broadway, Chicago, Illinois, he stated that his current business operates under the name Showtime. Mr. Horowitz acknowledged that he had been known in the music business in Chicago under the name Jack Howard for many years. Mr. Horowitz stated that he would not discuss the matter involving Jack Rubenstein as he wanted no part whatsoever of this individual. Mr. Horowitz refused to make himself available for an interview, stated he wished that he never had acknowledged having known Rubenstein many years ago when Rubenstein lived in Chicago. Mr. Horowitz states that Rubenstein was only a passing acquaintance of his and he knows nothing uh, concerning him. Okay, back to CIA memo. June 4th, 1964. To J. Lee Rankin, subject, information developed on the activity of Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City. Please note, this is the Kerry Thornley additional material file. Uh, Garrison put a lot of uh, information on Mexico City into Kerry Thornley's files because he knew Kerry Thornley went to Mexico City. Kerry Thornley admitted it to him in his 50-page affidavit where he admits that he was there in September 63, not in May. And we shall continue. On November 26, 1963, a young Latin American referred to herein as D came to the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. He claimed that he had been in the Cuban consulate in Mexico City on 18th September 63, when a man he later recognized to be Lee Harvey Oswald received 6500 in cash to kill an important person in the United States. Okay, this story, I've, heard, I've read this before. Not really putting too much faith into this because what's the date on here? 18th of September 1963. Oswald didn't go to Mexico City then. Allegedly, Oswald didn't go to Mexico City till September 26th. And I can place Carrie Thornley in New Orleans that week of September 18th. So it wasn't Carrie Thornley. I have no reason to believe William Seymour ever went to Mexico City. No evidence points that way. So I don't buy this statement at all. But I'll continue. D described the circumstances as follows while standing by a bathroom door. About noon, he saw a group of three persons con conversing on a patio a few feet away. One was tall, thin Negro with reddish hair, obviously dyed, who spoke rapidly in both Spanish and English. Well, that guy doesn't match to anybody in the cast of characters. He had prominent cheekbones and noticeable scar on the lower side of his chin. The second was a white person whom the subject had seen previously in a waiting room carrying a Canadian passport. The white person had green eyes and blondish hair with a pompadour hairdo and dark eyeglasses. The third person allegedly was Willie Harvey Oswald, D was completely convinced, convinced of this 
from published photos of Oswald following the assassination. Oswald was wearing a black sport coat, buttoned up white shirt with collar tabs, no tie, dark gray pants, and clear eyeglasses. Doesn't sound like anybody we know, does it? He had a green passport in his pocket, wore a wristwatch with a yellow band, and appeared to have a pistol in his shoulder holster. A tall Cuban joined the group momentarily and passed American currency to the Negro. The Negro then allegedly said to Oswald in English, I want to kill the man. Oswald replied, you're not man enough. I can do it. The Negro then said in Spanish, I can't go with you. I have a lot to do. Oswald replied, the people are waiting for me back there. The Negro then gave Oswald 6,500 in large denomination U.S. bills saying, this isn't much. After hearing his conversation, D said that he telephoned the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City several times on September 20th before the assassination in an attempt to report his belief that someone important in the United States was to be killed, but was finally told by someone at the embassy to stop wasting his time. D was known in this agency as a former informant of Latin American Security Service. His reliability was considered questionable by U.S. authorities, although he had not been wholly discredited. D claimed he was in Mexico City working against the Cuban communists for his service. This service, however, has a deni has denied that he was acting on its behalf, while an investigation in the United States showed that Oswald could not possibly have been in Mexico City on the 18th of September. He was known to have been in New Orleans on both September 17th and 19th. Intensive interrogation failed to shake D's story. On the 28th of November, 1963, the Mexican police interviewed him. At first, D persisted in his story, but on 30th November, he admitted in a signed statement that this whole account about Oswald was false. He admitted he had not seen Lee Oswald at all, that he had not seen anybody paid money in the Cuban embassy. He also admitted he had not tried uh, repeatedly to phone warnings to the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City on the 20th of September, as had been previously claimed. Instead, he had first contacted the U.S. Embassy after the assassination. D said that his uh, motive in telling this false story was to help get himself admitted to the United States so he could participate in action against Fidel Castro. He said that he hated Castro and thought that his story about Oswald, if believed, would help cause the United States to take action against Castro. Following the above interrogation, D promptly retracted his confession made to the Mexican authorities, asserting that it had been extorted from him under pressure. He was then questioned by U.S. authorities using a polygraph machine. D voluntarily consented to the use of this equipment. During the question, it was pointed out to him that he was not being truthful, according to the polygraph, in identifying photographs of Oswald as the person he saw in the Cuban consulate. He replied that he had full faith in the polygraph, that he would not attempt to refute the results, and that he must have been mistaken. In addition, he changed his story regarding the day he visited the Cuban consulate, finally deciding it took place on Tuesday, September 17th. It was concluded from the results of the polygraph that D had fabricated a story about Oswald in Toto. D has since been deported by the Mexican authorities to his native country. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure we got a lot of that post-assassination. All right, more FBI documents. Commission Exhibit 3152. Allegations by informant T-32. On November 25, 1962, T-32 made contact with the United States Embassy at Mexico DF and advised the following... T-32 entered Mexico illegally from Guatemala. On August 29, 1963, traveled to Mexico, DF, and subsequently made contact with Nicaraguan communists residing in Mexico City. From this contact, a plan was developed for T-32 to travel to Cuba to study guerrilla warfare. He had occasion to visit the Cuban consulate in Mexico, DF. I don't know what that DF is. Um several different times for the purpose of obtaining travel documents for the Q for Cuba by furnishing false identification papers as a Mexican citizen. He stated on September 18, 1963, he went to the Cuban consulate and while sitting in the waiting room saw a group of approximately eight persons enter the consulate at the office of Cuban consul Azubio SQ. Uh, a person unknown to him was sitting at SQ's desk. A short time later, while Source was standing near the door at the men's room at the Cuban consulate, he noticed three men conversing a few feet away from him. One of them was tall, thin Negro with reddish hair. Yeah, we already went over the bulk of what they're talking about here. I'm just trying to see if there's actually anything uh, to elaborate on. If Garrison were to put this in the file at all, <clears throat> he thought that it had some merit. 
Perhaps he thought it was Carrie Thornley. Perhaps he just gathered this in his research on Carrie Thornley. Just in case. You never know. Because in the end, it doesn't seem to really have much um, substance here. All right, moving on. Commission's Exhibit 2944. I'm sorry, 2946. A characterization of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee appears in the appendix pages of this report. On December 7, 1963, MMT-1, another government agency which conducts security investigations, furnished information that on December 6, 1963, a diplomat had reported to MMT-1 that the assassination of President Kennedy was allegedly the result of a plot prepared and executed jointly by the Chinese communists and Fidel Castro through intermediaries. It was advised that the diplomat had obtained this information from an unidentified source, tentatively described by the diplomat as very good. The allegation was that Fidel Castro was extremely worried over the current investigation into the assassination and possible findings, that the plot was arranged by Chinese communists and Cuban sympathizers. About a dozen persons who were privy to the plot have been provisionally jailed in Cuba to prevent any indiscretions which could pr prove dangerous to the Cuban government at this time. The diplomat's source was fearful his own arrest was imminent. The allegation continued that one first name unknown, Saavedra, oh, Saavedra, an alleged close friend of Celia Sanchez, the latter secretary of Fidel Castro, had uttered indiscretions in Cuba, which pointed to the complicity of the Chinese communists and Castro in the assassination. So this is just an interesting, uh, maybe just coincidence, who knows, but this the allegation continued that one first name unknown, Saavedra, an alleged close friend of Celia Sanchez, the latter secretary of Fidel Castro, had uttered indiscretions in Cuba, which pointed to the complicity of the Chinese communists and Castro in the assassination. Okay, so, I forget the date, but before the assassination, I think this is in the 50s, actually, um, Lauren Hall, Santos Traficante, and a guy named Henry Saavedra were deported back to America. And here we have a first name unknown and a last name of Saavedra. Hmm. This strikes me as too much of a coincidence, but who knows. Also, according to the allegation, the intermediaries in the plot located in Dallas, Texas, are Ramon B. Cortez, identified as a half Mexican, half American, and first name unknown, Fernandez Fito, identified as a Cuban. These men were alleged to have been financed through an unidentified bank at 14 Wall Street, New York City. MMT-1 advised it was further reported that a Cuban refugee, uh, Robert Nieto, residing at 5040 Westwood Lake Drive, South Miami, Florida, might possess details concerning Cortez and Fernandez. Yeah, this seems like a bunch of nonsense. A bunch of uh, propaganda disinformation. Why it's in the Thornley Files, we will never know. Robert Nieto Diaz Granados, born October 29, 1915, in Santiago de Cuba, stated he had been an attorney in Havana, Cuba, before arriving in the United States as a refugee on January 1, 1962. He stated he currently resides with his family at 5040 Westwood Lake Drive, South Miami, Florida. He said he knows no one by the name of Ramon Cortez or anyone with the surname of Fernandez Fieto. He was shown a photograph of Ramon Cortez, born August 31, 1916, location not verified, and stated he did not know the latter. Mr. Nieto stated that he does not know any diplomat. Mr. Nieto stated that he does not know any persons named Robert or Roberto Nieto. He stated he possessed no information whatsoever pertaining to the activities of individuals connected with the assassination of President Kennedy. So, let me make a point here. Um, these are obviously irrelevant documents, right? They really just are dead ends that go nowhere. So, when they say that there are 5 million documents on the Kennedy assassination, which there are, 4,800,000, fucking 99999, you know the deal, are just like this. They go fucking nowhere. A bunch of nonsense. I got an FBI file that's got about 100 pages of like pictures and shit that little kids drew and sent into the White House in the Kennedy files, right? So most of the Kennedy files are just complete and total fucking nonsense. Like this disinformation stuff we're going over right here. Let me see. I'm going to skip past this fucking crap because it seems to be irrelevant. Um, all right. So, 
Uh, CIA memorandum from J. Lee Rankin, subject Lee Harvey Oswald. In response to your request, I forward the following information regarding Lee Harvey Oswald's stay in Helsinki. Remember, Oswald stopped over in Helsinki to get his passport to Moscow. And that's what they're talking about. According to a reliable source, Oswald stayed at the Torney Hotel in Helsinki from 10 to 11 October 1959 and then moved to the Klaus Kirky Hotel, where he stayed until the 15th of October, apparently waiting for a visa to be issued to be issued him by the Soviet consulate in Helsinki. He traveled to the USSR by train, crossing at Veinikala on the 15th of October. Oswald's trip... To the, to the Soviet Union is interesting. I'm going to have to spend some time on it one day deeply because it went way too easy for him. He obviously had intelligence points of contacts along the way. All right, moving on. I really don't give a shit about this Cuba stuff. Uh, it was Kerry Thornley in Cuba, obviously. Um, all right, so I'll continue. Here we go. Uh, FBI memo, May 26, 64, to the Honorable J. Lee Rankin. Dear Mr. Rankin, references made in your letter dated April 23, 64, wherein you requested that certain investigation be conducted based on testimony furnished to your commission by Mr. Carlos Brunier. Enclosed are two copies of each of the reports of Special Agent James J. O'Connor, dated May 8, 64, at Miami, Florida, and Special Agent Stephen M. Callender, dated May 15, 64, at New Orleans, Louisiana. Both are self-explanatory. Also enclosed are single copies of the following publications requested by you. He's got a bunch of Latin American newspapers. The pertinent articles contained in these documents are referred to in your reference letter have been translated and incorporated into the enclosed Miami report. Item 3 of your reference letter concerns alleged lapsus lingue committed by Castro in a speech given at the University of Havana on November 27, 1963, at which time Castro allegedly indicated Oswald had been in Cuba. That I know nothing about. Uh, enclosed are two copies of a translation of this speech, pertinent uh, portions of which have been included in the enclosed Miami report. A review of this speech fails to indicate any slip of the tongue as alleged. It is noted, however, that page 33, the last paragraph of the enclosed Miami report relating to Castro's speech, contains a statement wherein Castro refers to Oswald's visit to the Cuban embassy in Mexico, following which he corrected himself, indicating that he meant Cuban consulate. This would possibly be the basis for the slip of the tongue referred to by Herminio Portelvia. Two copies of the memorandum dated May 1564, setting forth the results of an interview with Herminio Portelvilla, uh, writer of the article containing the above-mentioned allegation are also enclosed. Okay, gotcha. So what this is covering is covering someone reported that Castro said that Oswald had been in Cuba, but that's not what he said. When they went back and reviewed it, he just acknowledged that he had been to the Cuban consulate in Mexico City. Everyone's fucking fascinated with Cuba. Not me. Like, I could give two goddamn shits about Cuba because Oswald never fucking went there. Right? But some people make the biggest goddamn deal about it in the fucking world. It's it's unreal. I guess when you can't figure anything out, you just study the fucking mundane. All right. Continuing through Mexico City. Continuing through Mexico City. Don't give a shit about Mexico City. All right. What is this? More Mexico fucking city. God, I don't give two goddamn fucks about Mexico City. It wasn't Oswald. It was Kerry Thornley, and that's all the fuck you need to know. More shit on Castro. More shit on Castro. Don't give a fuck. Skipping all this shit. Um. All right. Finally, we're past Mexico City. All right. So, it seems to pick up here. All right, so it picks up here. It looks like a photocopy from inside of a book, and it's marked on the top and bottom, so the whole page must be important. So let me go ahead and read this. It starts cut off. 
September and brought Marina Oswald and the baby back to Irving, Texas. Oswald's uncle, Charles Moret. Okay, Charles Moret worked for the mob. Oswald's uncle, Charles Moret, also paid for the short trip taken by Oswald and his family from New Orleans to Mobile, Alabama on July 27, 63. It is estimated that when Oswald left for Mexico City, God damn it, fuck Mexico City! God, fuck you and your Mexico City. It's irrelevant. I'm over your bullshit on Mexico City. It is estimated that when Oswald left for Mexico City in September 63, he had accumulated something over $200. Marina Oswald testified that when he left for Mexico City, he had, quote, a little over 100 though she may not have taken into account the $33 unemployment compensation check which Oswald collected after her departure from New, York, from New Orleans. In any event, expenses in Mexico have been estimated at approximately $85 based on transportation costs of... Okay, this is fucking nonsense since Oswald never went there, right? Do you understand why I'm getting fucking irritated? Because this is like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pages on fucking Mexico City and nobody never went fucking went there. And it's taking up my fucking broadcast time here. Jesus Christ. All right, you know something? Fuck this file. We're going to pull something else up. We're going to go and we're going to look for the goddamn Perry Russo file. Because the Perry Russo file is all about fucking Carrie Thornley. All right. So, Perry Russo. And the reason I'm jumping to this in the Carrie Thornley files is because this is all about Carrie Thornley. Perry Russo's claim to fame is that he goes to a fucking party um, in at David Ferry's house, where he allegedly meets Oswald. But it wasn't Oswald, it was Carrie Thornley. He describes him as having a big bushy beard and all this stuff. So, here we go. We're going to move over. Sorry I got fucking angry. I'm just so fucking tired of going through fucking 200-page files where 60 of them are on bullshit. God, what a waste of my fucking time. All right, here we go. Seems to be a transcript from an interview in the Garrison Files on Perry Russo. And this is going to lead us to the party involving Oswald, whereas Oswald is actually Carrie Thornley. Um, so Garrison, when he handled um, Perry Russo, he kind of handled it kind of... What he did was fucked up. He gave the guy sodium pentothal, right? He hypnotized them and he did all kinds of shit. But nonetheless, Perry Russo was able to provide details... Uh, on his interactions with Thornley as Oswald uh, that he wouldn't have known otherwise uh, if if he wasn't there and if he wasn't right where he said he was. So the fact that they put him under some fucking sodium pentothal, which is like, would completely eliminate any possibility of you being used as a witness today. If you guys dosed with sodium pentothal, like, you'd be laughed out of a fucking courtroom. So, uh, starting with the doctors, an interview with the doctor and Perry Russo, and they're going to guide him through some questions. Uh, Perry, I'm going to ask you uh, a date as you see that date on the television screen. Uh, lift your right index finger, all right? I wonder uh, what date you'll see. September 16th. I wonder what year, Perry. No year. Look at the television, and a picture will come on, and when the picture becomes very vivid to you, the program begins. Lift your right index finger, and if you care to, you can tell me about that picture. I see David Ferry just sitting around, just talking. And he asked me if I wanted a cup of coffee or a glass of water or a Coke. I wanted water from the kitchen and icebox. Continue looking at the television program and tell me more about it. Dave and I were sitting, and he was on the big sofa, and I was on the small sofa. And he has on a white shirt and baggy fucking pants. He asked me if I could have uh, registered, if I had registered in school. Perry, look around the room. I wonder, is there a calendar on the wall? Yes. And what month is on the calendar? September. And what year, Perry? 1963. Continue looking at the television. Tell me everything you see. Dave took me home and he said he would pick me up tomorrow. And I told him that I had to go to school. I was sitting in the car and he said that he would pick me up tomorrow. He said he would come over at two and I told him I had to go to school and I'm not in school. Continue looking at the television picture and notice the newscast. The president, President Kennedy, is coming to New Orleans. And as you look, describe it to us. I'm at school and it is late. I was fucking going to see President Kennedy and I remember I ran up a long ramp and elevated an incline and I am with Al Cezanne and we were just waiting and Kennedy hasn't arrived. I figured we were late and we just stood and waited and he drove up on the ramp with sirens and started his speech. Who's that white-haired gentleman that is over there looking at President Kennedy? He's either with the New Orleans Police Department or government because my friend remarked about it. He said that he only... He was the, the only one not looking at the president. He was looking at us. Then Al went over to the exit. Kennedy was getting ready to finish. 
I went to the exit, which is like an airplane hangar, and I stayed because I was interested in Kennedy. He talked a while to the boy, and this boy left the scene, and the Secret Service man went and talked to these other two men. All the Secret Service men had on loud coats. How about this white-haired gentleman? That was him. Do you know his name? No. We are looking at the television screen again, and when it is clear again, your finger will lift up. Study the picture, and you are in an automobile driving into a service station. Tell me about that program on the television. I had trouble with my car because it wouldn't start in a red light, at a red light, and I didn't have any money except four or five dollars, and I just drove in, and an old friend of mine came up and said, hey, you remember me? And I said, yes. These boys fixed the tire, took the battery out, charged the battery, and I had to pay two fifty, and I left. Tell me about the white-haired man sitting in the automobile over there. He's just sitting with Dave, and they are just talking, and I interrupted their conversation, and he thought it was rude, and he left. He was sitting next to Dave, and I yelled to Dave about getting the boys to hustle. I had to go because he was very ill at ease because Dave and I were suspicious of each other. About what, Perry? He told me he was going to kill me. Why, Perry? Because I broke up he and Al. Isn't there a calendar in the service station somewhere, Perry? No. I wonder what is the day, 1964. What is the month, Perry? March. And I wonder what the day is in March. I don't know. Take a look at the white-haired man again in the automobile, and when you see him, lift your finger up. Did you ever see that man before? So what is going on here is um, Perry Russo, they're hypnotizing him. Um, They're trying to show uh, a relationship between David Ferry and Clay Shaw. And Perry Russo is allegedly a witness to this. And so the white-haired man that he's talking about, who was parked at Dave Ferry's service station talking to Dave, is most certainly Clay Shaw. That's why this is significant. Where did you see him before? At the Nashville Wharf. This television screen is going to jump over again, and when it does, lift your finger. Look at the picture now, because on the screen you are in your apartment on Elysian Field Street, and somebody is going to come in with two jungle instructors. It is Dave. It is about one o'clock, and I laughed when I saw him because the guys were some more friends of his, and Landry told me about his friends. They were very dirty. And I wonder, Perry, what color was their hair? Black hair. Both had black hair. Black hair. What color were their trousers, Perry? Green. Green shirt. Were both dressed in green? Yes. Two other people were there. Al's friends came in from the CAP and another boy. I never saw him before. I saw this friend in Kenner at a CAP meeting. Tell me more about it, Perry. Well, Dave asked me how I was, how I was doing, and I talked to him for a while, and I got introduced. I wonder, Perry, how he introduced you as his friend. And by what name did he introduce you, Perry? And how did he introduce the others, Manuel? And I wonder about the other one. He introduced the others to me. The boy came in from the CAP was Tommy. This was Tommy who, Perry? Just Tommy. And this was Tommy who, Perry? He asked him a second time. I was never told, just Tommy. These guys spoke Spanish and the two boys were about my age and we just talked and talked. Did you hear someone mention Juliana? I thought I did. Oh, I think Manuel called her the other guy, Juliana. Julie, Spanish. Julie, Jules. They talked in Spanish, and Ferry talked in Spanish. They were very impolite, don't you think, to talk in Spanish in front of you? I figured that was all they could speak. Continue to go deeper and deeper to sleep. You are comfortable and blank. Look at the television screen. Picture and visualize, and your finger will lift again when it is clear. That is right, a picture is going to come on, and you are in Ferry's apartment on Louisiana Parkway. Would you look at the picture and tell us the story that you see? He introduced me to his roommate who was a kook. This is Carrie Thornley. And Perry, I wonder what his roommate looked like. Describe him for me. Looked like uh, he would be about as tall as I and he had sandy brown hair, dirty white shirt, and dirty, 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 dirty. And Perry, his name, Leon. His last name, Oswald. That is right. Continuing looking at the picture, who else is in the apartment? Nobody, just me and him. Just you and Ferry and Oswald. That's right, Perry. Keep looking at the picture and tell me what happens. He introduced me, and we talked, and Ferry came in and served coffee, and I didn't take any, and the roommate was just sitting on the piano. It was closed, and he just sat, and Ferry and Leon didn't seem to get along that night. They had differences of opinion? Yes. What about Perry? Dave never stated, but I got the idea it was about a boy Dave was sleeping with, and Leon made some remarks about it. And Leon objected to the boy being there. That's right. Continue to go deeper and deeper. 
Now picture that television screen again, Perry. And there's a picture of Fairy's apartment and there are several people in there and there is a white-haired man. Tell me about it. We're having a party and I came in and everybody's drinking beer. There are about 10 of us and I am there. The roommate, Dave, some young boys and some other friend of Dave's and I was with Sandra. That's Sandra Moffat. And what month is it? September. September 16th. And what year, Perry? 1963. Tell me more about that picture. Well, there is a record player in the middle of the room and it is playing sounds, not music. Spanish, and a guy is making a speech, and everybody laughed. <coughs> and what did he say? He was speaking Spanish, sort of like Hitler. He got real excited. And how about the white-haired man? That's a friend of Dave's. His name? Clem Bertrand. Had you, had you seen him before? Yes, I saw him at the Nashville Street Wharf. I wonder where else. Nowhere. Is that the same white-haired gentleman in the service station? I don't remember the service station. I wonder who that is sitting on the sofa with the rifle. Leon. What is he doing with the rifle, Perry? He always had a rifle. He liked guns, and many times he would have a rifle. This particular rifle, describe it for me, Perry. He's not on the sofa. On the sofa half. Tell me about the rifle. Look at it. Describe it for me, Perry. Long and has a wooden or plastic stock. It looks brown, and it has a sight for hunting. What kind of sight? A barrel type, about eight inches long. Take a look at the gun again. Does it have a lever underneath that you put bullets in? I have a twenty-two, and it's the same type. He offered to show it to me, but I didn't care to look at it. Same as my twenty-two. You have to pull the bolt back, and then cartridges have to be enter from below. Continue looking at the television program, and Clay, the white-haired man, is going to come into the room. You're at Fairy's apartment, and there are many people. Who did he introduce Clay to? He introduced me, me to everybody. How did he introduce you and exactly what did he say? Well, when I walked in, everybody was excited for maybe 30 seconds or a minute. Then the merriment resumed. There were no girls. Records were playing, just voices. Uh, everybody in the house was laughing and Dave said, this is my friend Perry who lives on Elysian Fields. And he had introduced me to everybody. Make believe you are a fairy introducing Perry around. I'm Perry Russo. I'm Perry Russo. Where's Juliana staying? He's in the back, and I wonder, Perry, where is Manuel? Just sitting, not standing. Everybody is getting up and moving. What names did Ferry use for the other people he introduced you to? I was shocked by the people, and I don't speak Spanish. There were a couple of boys uh, that looked American to me, and we shook hands with uh, two or three. And there is Joe and Harry. Tell me, where is Bertrand? Sitting on the sofa. I wonder, is this the uh, white-haired man? Yes. Could you count the Cubans that are in the room for me, Perry? Four. I wonder, are they pro-Castro? I don't know. I didn't talk to them. Anti-Castro? I didn't talk to them. They're in green fatigues, one in khaki pants, and he is short and strong and hefty and has on a t-shirt. One may be 22 or 25, and he's dressed in dungarees and checked yellow and red and blue and lots of colors in his shirt. And there are two other men. Pointing to where Joe is sitting for me, Perry. Uh, no response. Julian? They are up and down. Everybody is moving around. Manuel is there. Yes, Perry. And what about the other two Cubans? Only four. Julian, Manuel, and there were two others. Everybody went to the kitchen. I drank a Coke, and the record was taken off, and we sat around talking, and these guys spoke Spanish. Look over there, Perry. Tell me what Leon is doing. He's sitting beside the piano, just sitting. He does the same thing. I don't like him because he doesn't like me. He told Dave the first time I saw him in front of me, why did he have to bring every little prick off the street in his house? And I told Dave I wanted to go home. Let your mind go completely blank, Perry. See that television screen again. It is very vivid. Not notice the picture on the screen. There will be Bertrand, Ferry, and Oswald, and they're going to discuss a very important matter. And there's another man and a girl there, and they are talking about assassinating somebody. Look at it and describe it to me. We were sitting around on the sofas and I came in late. Dave offered me a drink and I said no, I didn't want anything. And I sat down and played like I belonged. I didn't know what was going on. Dave went and got drinks for everybody. All the drinks were coffee and they resumed the conversation and I was just sitting. They planned to assassinate President Kennedy. Tell us exactly what everyone said, Perry. 
Dave paced the floor back and forth and he talked and talked and told them if they were to get the president, they would fly to Mexico or Cuba, onto Brazil. And Clem said they would not go to Mexico and Brazil. It involved too much gas expense and the cooperation of Mexican authorities, and that wouldn't be possible. Leon snapped at Bertrand and said to leave him alone. I guess Ferry and Leon had made up and Leon said, leave him alone because he is right because he said, if we go, we can do it. It doesn't make any difference, Japan or Mexico. I wonder if what they said about Dallas, Perry. Uh, Nothing about Dallas. Ferry had a bunch of newspaper clippings about one inch thick, all of them about Kennedy. Kennedy's picture or Kennedy's name in the headline had rubber bands and clips on them and carried them around with him. I wonder if Ferry ever told you that he was going to assassinate the president in Dallas. He never told me that he was going to do uh, to going to assassinate the president, and I laughed at him, but I never laughed in front of his friends. Is Clay Bertrand the same man that you saw in the district attorney's office and the same person you went to sell insurance to yesterday, Perry? Dave never took me to his house. You went to his house yesterday to sell insurance with somebody from the district attorney's office, Perry. Is that the same man that was in with Ferry and Oswald and the same man that was at the wharf? I don't understand. Dave never showed me any places like that. Now go to sleep, Perry. And now, Perry, I want you to see the television screen again when you visualize it, and it is clear you will see the face of a white-haired man. You met him yesterday when you went to his apartment. This is yesterday, the last day of February. You picture him in your mind. Have you seen him before? Have you seen him on several occasions? And what were those occasions, Perry? He was Dave's friend, and I saw him at Dave's house. Where else did you see him? I later saw him at Dave's and Al's service station. We'll talk about the service station another time because there was some major obfuscation over the Al that actually worked there with Dave. Was it Al Landry or was it Al Boboof? Because we have witnesses attesting to both. Where else, Perry? I saw him at the Nashville Street Wharf. What is his name, Perry? uh, Clay Bertrand. Perry, see the television screen again. A picture is going to flip up. And this is the last time you saw Oswald and Ferry together. Describe the scene to me. I came over to Dave's house and we were just talked about the usual stuff and the roommate had to leave. He brought out two bags all beat up. The suitcases were like a canvas bag with extra pouches and a real heavy canvas and he has a little smaller bag and he's just leaving. I guess Dave is kicking him out. And Dave, I wonder, where is he going? Houston. Um, Look up at the top of the television screen from what you'll see the date on the film came on. What date? October 7th, 1963. Is this the same roommate that is called Lee Oswald? Leon. Perry, I imagine you know Leon Oswald. Was he married? Yes. What was his wife's name? Margaret. So this is a name out of nowhere. This Margaret name is like... Oswald's wife's name was Marina. There's no Margaret attached to anybody else, so it was obviously just made up. Perry, I'm very interested in finding out everything I possibly can about Ferry's roommate, the one who was named Leon Oswald. I want you to get a good picture in your mind of the first time you saw Leon Oswald in Ferry's apartment. Tell us about that. He was sitting, and I came in with Dave, and he just he was seated, and he just looked up. Did he have a beard? Lots of whiskers, not a beard. I thought he may have pasted it on. Okay, so this will be in my chapter, but the first couple times he sees this guy, he's got a beard. Then he shaves, and he sees him here with stubble, like whiskers, right? That is how he will appear again when he sees him at the party on the 16th. Are you sure about that? No, I never asked Ferry. What is the date you first saw Leon Oswald? September 13th. Who else is in the apartment besides Ferry and Oswald and yourself? That's all. Can you tell me the very next time you saw Oswald in the apartment? Three days later. September 16th? Yes. Who was in the apartment then? A gang of Dave's friends. Was Manuel there? Yes. Was Julian there? That's uh, Julian Benzo, probably. Uh, the other Cuban. I don't know. Do you remember the two Cubans Ferry brought to your apartment on Elysian Fields? Now, Perry, tell me the names of the two Cubans there at this time at Ferry's apartment on September 16th. Are they the two friends brought to your apartment on Elysian Fields Avenue? I am not sure. Picture the television screen again, Perry, and lift an index finger up on your right hand when the picture is clear. All right. And now you see several pictures... And now you see a serial picture and there is a date and there will be a serial picture of each time you have seen Leon Oswald and the date is in the upper right hand corner. September 13th, another picture flips. September 16th at Dave's, picture flips again. October 7th at Dave's, 
Continue, the picture flips again. No response. Continue to go deeper and relax with each breath. You were telling me about Oswald leaving to go to Houston. I wonder, Perry, who was Oswald going to visit in Houston? I don't know. I may, it may be his wife, but I never had seen her, and I don't know where she is, but I, but I do know the guy was married, and I figured Dave was kicking him out. I wonder, Perry, who was Brett Wall? It's actually Brecht Wall. Uh, a friend of Leon. He was supposed to help Leon. Okay, so this is super important. So Brecht Wall lives at the Adolphus Hotel in Dallas, friends of Jack Ruby, um, participates in a alibi phone call for Jack Ruby over the weekend of the 21st, uh, 23rd, 24th. Uh, but here, now we have a connection between Perry Russo and Brecht Wall. Um, Perry Russo, having witnessed Leon Oswald claiming that Brecht Wall was his friend, therefore we now have a connection between Brecht Wall and Kerry Thornley. Boom. That's a connection I didn't have before. Kind of irrelevant. Don't really, really know where to put it. Um, but it just goes to show that all these people involved were all working together and that Brecht Wall was definitely in the mix, even though he kind of plays the victim when it comes to his Warren Commission testimony. So, all right, here we go. And I wonder, who was Jack Ruby? I don't know. I wonder if Brett Wall knew Jack Ruby. I don't know. And I wonder if Ferry knew Brett Wall. I guess so. It sounded like a mutual acquaintance Ferry asked Leon if he would be there. So, ah, now we have a connection from Brett Wall to David Ferry, as well as Carrie Thornley. I wonder if Ferry asked Leon if he would be at Brett Wall's place in Houston. He just asked Leon if Brett Wall would be there. He said he supposed so. So, here's another thing we can connect here. So, we have David Ferry connection to, obviously, Carrie Thornley. Carrie Thornley and David Ferry have a connection to Brett Wall. Brecht Wall 100% has a connection to Jack Ruby. Thus, now we have a one person removed between David Ferry and Jack Ruby. Written right fucking here, okay? So, obviously, Jack Ruby knew David Ferry. Plus, David Ferry was alleged to have been seen in the Carousel Club with Kerry Thornley. Um, interesting, interesting. Funny I don't remember this. I wonder if Ferry asked Leon if he would be at Brett Wall's place in Houston. He just asked Leon if Brett Wall would be there. He said he's supposed to... Okay, so here's... Oh, this is another interesting thing. So if he's supposed to be meeting Brett Wall in Houston, I guarantee you it's not in Houston because Brett Wall didn't live in Houston. Brett Wall lived in Dallas. But who did Brett Wall know that lived in Galveston? Robert McEwen. Yep. Robert McEwen who Brett Wall allegedly goes and visits over the weekend of the assassination, but he never did, okay? He allegedly went and saw, stayed with a guy in his family named Thomas McKenna, Thomas McKenna, alias for Robert McEwen. But Brett Wall never made that fucking trip. It was an alibi phone call that Jack Ruby allegedly made from Brett Wall's place, or the Carousel Club, down to Brett Wall down in um, Galveston. However, Brett Wall never made that trip. So it was an alibi phone call because Jack Ruby was in Galveston. But now we have this interview where Perry Russo is connecting the dots between Jack Ruby, David Ferry, Brent Wall in Houston, which to me is an automatic connection to Robert McEwen. Fascinating stuff. All right. Moving on. Uh, I wonder where Oswald was going to be in Houston, Perry. He didn't say. And I wonder who Larry Rost is. No response. Oh, this is good. I wonder what is the Winterland Skating Rink in Houston. I know one in New Orleans on St. Claude Street. Okay, so let's swallow this whole fucking beginning paragraph here. So um, he asked him where he's going to be in Houston. He said he doesn't know. And then he asked him about Larry Rost. If you'll remember from the Winterland Ice Rink uh, shows that we did, I talked about Larry Rost. And how Larry Rost was the, like the, the mainstay instructor at the Winterland the whole time. And so then he goes, I wonder what is uh, the Winterland skating rink in Houston? And then what does Perry Russo say? He goes, I know of one in New Orleans on St. Claude Street. Okay, so the whole fucking excuse of David Ferry going to Houston to go went to go to Winterland to go ice skating is bullshit. Because it's an ice skating rink on St. Claude Street in fucking New Orleans. Ha, good stuff. Uh, I wonder, Perry, where Leon was supposed to meet Brett Wall. Dave didn't say. I wonder if it was just in Houston or some other place. I don't know. I wonder what mutual friend Ferry and Leon 
had. Uh, they were both friends with, I wonder if they had any other friends. Fairy, Leon, like Brett Wall. Manuel. In what way, Perry? I heard both of them talk about them. Did you hear them both talk about Julian? No. I wonder what they said about Manuel. Just general conversation. Dave referred to him, and later on, Leon referred to him. Could they trust Manuel? I don't know. They didn't say. I wonder what role Manuel could have played in the president's assassination. They don't put people in roles. I wonder if Manuel was supposed to help in killing the president. Yes. How, Perry? He was to be the diversionary. Names were discussed as to who could do this and who could do that. They asked questions about who could be put in that spot. I wonder, Perry, if they ever asked or if they ever talked to anyone about shooting a gun from the school window or the grassy knoll. No. I wonder what they talked about as to who they were going to assassinate the president, as to how they were going to assassinate the president. Dave said someone had gone up to President Eisenhower some time ago and they were able to touch him. And this goes to show they could do the job. He said there would be a crossfire with a mob in between. And if everybody was looking at the guy who was the diversionary, made the diversionary shot, the other guy could make the good shot. One would make the diversionary shot and the other would do the job. Who was going to be used for the diversionary shot and who the, for the actual shot, they never said. And it appears that this page ends here. Okay, so this is pretty fascinating because that wasn't necessarily the case in the Kennedy assassination. But who was it the case with? It was most certainly the case with the Robert Kennedy assassination with um, uh, Sirhan Sirhan and Thane Eugene Caesar. And it was most certainly the case um, with the assassination of Mayor Anton Cermak with Zangara being the patsy. Zangara fired, but he missed or had blanks or something um, because he shot with a 38, but when they dug the bullets out of uh, Cermak, it was, uh, he was shot with a 45, right? So that was definitely the case in that assassination as well. All right, what do we have here? And that brings, to the end, brings us to the end of the interview of Perry Russo. Uh, this Perry Russo stuff is all going to make it into my David Ferry chapter. I think I'm going to update my David Ferry chapter and add some of this stuff to it. Um, all right. So I think I'm going to call it here for the day. Um, I've been kind of sporadic lately. I've been exhausted as fuck. And I'm on the last chapter of the book. And so it's been really hard for me to get into the state of mind uh, to do these on a daily basis. But uh, I will be back here on Wednesday and we will continue with uh, Carrie Thornley Files part 11. Thank you, everybody.